so I think you guys should be, I don't know if you're watching, but <laughs> in terms of what's posted, I think you should be caught up on lectures except for uh, yesterday's lecture, which I still haven't posted. I uh, exported it wrong. Anyway, you don't want to hear about that, but I tried to put the title on it and you have to remember to cut the title so the title is on it the whole time, you know. Go through a lot of trouble for you guys. Any questions, though? Yes, ma'am. Um, could you like let people open the like ego, super ego, and that kind of question? Because um, I was watching the video and I couldn't really see where you were writing on the board. So. Okay, so you couldn't see that the ego, super ego stuff. Um, I mean, I I watched the whole thing. And I was sure, sure. I mean, uh, I'll go over over it briefly. Um, I will say that I covered it again in, in yesterday's lecture, kind of a review before I kind of picked up uh, from where I was going. So check that out uh, too when I get it posted. I'll probably try to post it right after uh, class. So it should be up uh, this evening at least. Um, but we were just talking about, you heard the descriptions, I hope. We were talking about the three parts. Maybe I should take that in under advisement, right, Digger? Uh, we, we were looking at the three parts of the mind, the id, the ego, and the superego. Uh, who can just tell me what they took from that lecture? What's the difference between these things? What's the id? All right, I'll you. Yes, ma'am, what you got? Basic survival. Okay, so it's got Basic, something you do with basic survival, what does that mean? Um, basically like ease through weaknesses and the like matter of aggression. Okay, so it's going to be those kind of aggressive parts of us, uh, those parts of us that are interested in survival, those parts of us that are interested in procreation, those parts of us that are interested in protecting ourselves and those people around us, right? So those very kind of animalistic, uh, territorial, dominance type of behaviors. All of these things are things that Freud would have said <clears throat> came out of the id, right? This, this more primitive, aggressive part of us. What about the super ego? What you got? Me. Yes, sir? I honestly really don't know. Well, I, all right, watch the videos. Yes, sir? Is it like a little deeper Uh, it is a, I guess you can start to call it a deeper kind of thinking, but it's got a particular characteristic. Okay. Yes, sir. Doesn't the superego try to um, satisfy the id? Or is it, is that? I think what you're describing sounds like the ego. The ego, okay. okay. I, I always get the two mixed up. The That's right. <laughs> Similar? Yes, ma'am. You got the id for us. You don't want to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the moral compass of your conscience. Right, so the superego is going to be this part of your mind that's your conscience, right? It's going to be the part of your mind that says, this is right, this is wrong. It's the things that you learn throughout your lifetime, certainly when you were growing up, about what's ethical, what's moral, uh, what your values are, what you should do, what you shouldn't do, right? All of these things are the superego. That is to say, you took them from the world and you made them your own, right? This is just your mind. So anything in the superego, though it seems like society wants, and it maybe does, but your conception of what society wants is your own mind telling you, you can't do this, you should do that. Does this make sense, superego? Ego. Yes, ma'am, in the red, the red mask. Not you, close. I got you next, though. Yes, ma'am, in the red mask. That's you with your hand over your face. Oh, uh, I think it's pink, maybe. Oh, yeah, it's pink, sorry. I got confused for a second. Um, to the ego, I kind of look at it how it kind of protects you from yourself and it kind of, it makes you kind of feel better because it masks kind of, if 
Okay, it's a piece of it, right? Yeah, there. I'm sorry, I just, I was... That's okay, I really like what you said about trying to make you feel better about yourself. What else? Do you know what the ego does? Well, y'all better catch up on these videos. I know this is a strange way to go to college, but I expect you to show up and know what I'm talking about. Who knows what the ego is? Put your hand in there. Yes, ma'am? It's kind of more of your decision-making, between the two, how you kind of rationalize the two, like how you rationalize between the two of being like, what, what is and isn't really reasonable. Very good. And so one thing that we often hear about the ego, one thing that we are often um, kind of told in pop culture sort of stuff is that the ego is this negotiator, right? If you've got this part of your mind that's very moralistic, that's very focused on what's right and wrong and what people are gonna think about you and what God's gonna think about you, however you conceive of morality, however you conceive of a conscience, right? Wherever that other side comes from. It's gonna probably have some problems with some things that are coming out of your id, the things that you just want that are maybe selfish and are maybe primitive and are maybe overly sexual, right? And so the superego and the id are often going to be in some sort of conflict. And folks often think of the ego as this sort of negotiator. Okay, you want this and you want this. Let's see. I don't know. You got it last time, so I'm going to let the id have it. Or, well, let's try to come to some middle ground. Maybe. The real purpose of the ego is to protect you from things that would make you feel bad, really. In particular, it protects you from the parts of yourself that would make you feel bad. That is to say, the ego, its main job is to make sure that you feel like you're a good person. Or at least that you can stand yourself, right? Its whole reason for existing is to help you feel like you can stand yourself. And in so doing, it gives you this sense of control of yourself, that sense of awareness of everything, the sense of I'm in charge here. I know all there is and all I need to know about things, about what's going on for me. Well, that's not quite true, right? So if you could see my diagram of the iceberg, who know, could you guys see that? Iceberg, blah, blah, blah. right? This is about all that the ego is. Mostly it, because you gotta survive. This is more important than liking yourself. Right? So we think about this as being who we are, and in fact, if we look at the conscious versus the unconscious mind, we can see that we can't even really see all of our ego. That even that part of us that feels like us, that keeps us liking ourselves. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I don't really like myself. Well, that's your ego convincing you to like yourself. Right? You start from not liking yourself, well, then you have this urge to want to like yourself so even that part isn't fully in our awareness does this make sense it, ego super ego again I covered some more in uh, which, which video will be posted today so you'll get a little bit of a rehash of that and then if you haven't watched I think it's last Thursday's video uh, where I spent some time uh, talking about this and I do some exercises with the class sounds like you might not be able to see the writing but this is what it is so draw any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Is there a subject matter? Uh, probably not. I haven't gotten through what I want to get through, so dates or subjects to change, I'll let you know. Um, I'll let you know somehow. Probably okay. email. That's the best way to talk to all of you, it seems. Most of you. Oh, wow. People still say they don't get stuff. Yeah. Um, I was trying to get into what's it called? Discord. Yeah. Um, I 
No, there's a lot of folks in there, so. Okay, I'll try and work on it, but I keep like, it's just like wanting to come up, so I can just use the screen. Okay. So try on your phone, it may work on your phone. There's an app for both the computer and the phone, that that'll be helpful. Yes, ma'am. Uh, no, I'm gonna get study guides. That's what your notes are for. Welcome to college. Um, yeah, go in class, take notes, watch the lectures, take notes. That's what we'll do on the test. I'll give you some sense of what's gonna be on the test, but I'm not gonna give you the answers to the test. Anything else? All right, uh, I forget my watch, of course, so we got some time. Uh, what I want to start talking about today are what's called Freud's psychosexual stages. And again, we're still talking about personality. And so Freud thought about this in a lot of different ways, right? He thought about conscious, unconscious, he thought about id, ego, superego, right? All of these different ways in which your personality may be being made up by the contents uh, of your psyche. The psychosexual stages, however, are more interested in, well, what things in your history might have led you to have a certain personality characteristics in particular, Freud, and really all of psychology at the time, was, wasn't really interested in the normal psychology. We were really more interested at the time in an abnormal psychology. So we're gonna maybe learn some things about a broader personality, but what Freud is really interested in, and I just want you to have this frame, is how can things that happened to you in your childhood give you personality flaws when, when you're an adult? So he's really sort of looking for those flaws. So what you're going to see here is that there's a way to kind of just do it right, and then there's a way to do it wrong. Sometimes a couple of ways to do it wrong. There's not a way to do it better, is what I mean. There's not a sense of like, oh, if you do a lot of this, your kid's going to be brilliant. It's if you do this, they'll be fine. If you do this, they're, I don't know, going to have some weird fetch question so far. So the way this looks, trying to find it. Yep. The way this looks um, is similar to what well, it is, a developmental uh, stage theory. And so when we get to human development, when we get to that point where we're thinking about how folks mature, how you go from childhood to adulthood, and how that activates different things in your mind. Uh, we're gonna see a couple more of these. Uh, I pushed, I put this one here again because it's a little bit more thinking about the development of personality. It is still sort of a human development piece, but uh, it's close, more closely related to personality than it is to sort of cognitive development, which is what we'll be talking about when we get there. Okay. Anybody got kids in here? Good, awesome. So I'll be coming to you a lot. How old's your kid? Uh, one five and one two. Awesome, so you're gonna maybe be able to help us fill this out quite a bit. All right, this kid's like, oh God. So the first stage goes from, I'm gonna move this over. goes from ages zero to 18 months. This stage is called the oral stage. So one thing to understand about Freud's psychosexual stages is that he's going to do two things. Well, three things. One, he's going to tell you the age range, so that's this first piece. The second thing that he's going to do is name a body part or a body area in some cases. 
And this has two meanings. One is a very literal meaning. Mom, can you tell us what's the literal meaning going on here for a kid that's just about one years old that has to do with oral? They talk a lot. What's that? They talk a lot. They talk a lot. Anything else? They cry. Anything else? They put a little stuff in their mouth. They eat. Here's what I'm looking for. Yes, ma'am. King Max. I think it was you. Who said it? Put on your voice. They put a lot of stuff in their mouth. They put a lot of stuff in their mouth. Right? Confirm? Yep. Mom says yes. They put a lot of stuff in their mouth. Why do they do it? They're teething for one. Good. That's how they learn. That's how they learn. They're eating. Right? All of this stuff. So one of the things we're going to see here again is just this kind of literal, this sort of literal reference to what's going on uh, for the kid at the time, okay? Um, what you should also know about that is the way that Freud framed it, and why it's called, by the way, the psychosexual stages, is because Freud would have said that this is the way that children, or whoever at this age, is receiving sexual pleasure. It's Freud's idea. He says that kids between zero and 18 months are putting things in their mouth for all the things that we just said, but also as a sort of sexual gratification for themselves. Well, that on the face of itself sounds wild. What does it mean? <clears throat> well, he doesn't mean sexual in the way that, that we quite mean sexual. Not yet, at least. Certainly not at 18 months. What he's noting, and this has been demonstrated in more modern science, is that children don't really have a sense of different types of pleasure the way that we do. They don't have a sense of different types of love the way that we do, right? So somebody patting your head is as good as somebody giving you something good to eat, etc. So kids don't have this differentiation of this is a sexual pleasure, and this is a loving, cuddly pleasure, and this is just tasting good. This just feels good on my gums, right? For them, it's just all pleasure. And so Freud aligns this with this idea of sexual. The other thing, I should probably keep titling things, The other thing that we're going to talk about, in, in addition to that literal physical piece, is the analogy. And here's where the real psychology is at work. There's a bit of um, archetypal psychology in here. We'll talk about what that means for the next week. But uh, what I mean to say is, is that Freud also has this sense of, in this case, the oral to mean, let me ask you, to mean what? What does it mean if, um, what does it mean if somebody offers you food? Um, I guess you eat it. What does it, what does it mean? Not what do you do with it. What does it mean if somebody offers you food? They're being, who said it? They're being polite. They're being polite? That's great, but because what that really speaks to is that they're trying to care for you, right? There's this sense of care that's given if somebody's offering you food. Even if it's just you and your buddies or your girlfriends hanging out, watching TV or playing video games, and they go in the kitchen and make you a sandwich, like that's nice, right? Why would you have to do that? I appreciate it. And so feeding, right, oral has this sense of, this analogy to being taken care of. And so what Freud's really interested in, in terms of psychology, in terms of the psychology of these stages, is what developmentally is the kid going through at that time? 
And it turns out that at this very early stage of development, what kids are figuring out is, is the world a safe place? Is it a place where people are gonna take care of me, in particular, probably my parents? Are they gonna take care of me? Are they gonna meet my needs? Or am I gonna be crying a lot because I'm not getting fed? Am I gonna be allowed to stick dangerous or dirty things in my mouth because nobody's watching me? Am I gonna be overfed? Is my mom not gonna respond to my needs? Oh, that's enough, stop putting that bottle in my mouth, right? Or is she gonna be very attentive and notice when I need to eat and feed me and that's enough, right? <clears throat> and so through this sort of idea of oral, Freud's really trying to get at the kid's first experience and perspective of the world as being a safe place or a non-safe place. <clears throat> What he says, out of these analogies, so we're right, uh, safety here. What he says out of these analogies <clears throat> is that if the kid gets it wrong, if the parent's not meeting the needs of the child in the way that, well, not that the child expects anything, but the way that as humans we are programmed to need to be cared for, right? You don't need to learn about abuse or neglect to, to feel it. And so kids have this awareness, and so they're sort of judging in the way that they can of, is this a safe environment? Is this a safe place? Are these safe people that I found myself with? So what type of... Uh, complex. Have you ever seen associated with oral? Has anybody ever called somebody something or heard somebody called something because they've got a certain oral I know how to finish this? Yes ma'am? Okay, somebody likes to talk a lot. That's one I haven't heard, but yes. Good. Is the word you're looking for fixation? That's the word I'm looking for. So I'm looking for oral fixation. Very good. What's it mean if somebody's got an oral fixation? They like to put things in their mouth. They like to put things in their mouth. Like what? What would be evidence of that? What are some things a person you would expect a person with an oral fixation to put in their mouth? Yes, ma'am. Uh, eating food. Whenever they get nervous, they start to bite at their nails or their thumb. Okay, so eating food is that the first thing you said? Yes. Or biting their nails? Yes. Very good. What else? Yes, ma'am. Gum. Probably. Gum. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, good. What else? Uh, Very good. Chewing on a pen or something. Good, looking for one more. So that's not your oral. <laughs> Playing with their ears. <laughs> what else? Yeah. Uh, whistling. Say what? Whistling. Whistling. What's the thing about that? Tell me if you can connect it when I connect it. If you can connect the whistling to everything else that's been said. One more. Oh, smoking. Right, smoking. Oral fixation. Mm -hmm. What do all of these things have in common? Eating, biting your fingernails, talking a lot, smoking, the other thing. What do all of these things have in common? Yes, ma'am. The mouth, I guess. Psychologically, why would you do any of these things? Sucking your thumb. Um, what else? It could be like a stress relief, or like if they're having like an anxiety, like they do those things to calm them down because they're so used to doing that, so something they turn to. Very good. They're trying to comfort themselves, right? They're trying to comfort themselves. And now we're back to here, right? This idea that Freud's connecting, again, he's trying to think about how adult personalities get formed. And he's connecting these dots of, hey, if you're a kid and you're not getting your needs met, right? You learn that you have to self-soothe, you have to suck your thumb, mom's not gonna feed you right away. She's not gonna necessarily let you go starving, but she'll let you cry for an hour or so. And so you gotta suck your thumb to feel better or she just leaves the pacifier in your mouth. 
right? Where you gotta cry and cry and cry and cry before you get attention, right? All of these things are ways of either both getting attention, talking a lot, which is a new one for me, or just getting comfort, sucking your thumb, eating, comfort eating, right? All of these different types of things, Freud would say, might have come from a person who figured out that other people weren't gonna meet their needs, and so they found all of these fixations, all of these things to do for themselves that would help them feel better, that would help them feel cared for, that would help them feel less stressed, less anxious. This one? Did it fit? Maybe so. Uh, maybe so, if, if it's this type of thing that they're doing uh, for comfort. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a theoretical idea, of course, right? And so it could be things that aren't really oral, to be, to be quite frank, right? But it, it really is just more about that idea of trying to care for yourself. And so drinking fits that because you're imbibing something, obviously. But you can imagine like a blankie or something that isn't exactly an oral thing, but it's still that kind of comfort, taking care of myself. Does that make sense? Okay, two years old. The six, that seems like a big jump. Eighteen to thirty-six months. Mom, what's going on? <laughs> what's going on in this thing? Um, crawling, walking. Mm -hmm. Okay. We already got through the oral stage. What's going on? What's a critical thing that's happening for a kid at this age? Anybody know? Yes. Are they being potty trained? Ah, they're being potty trained. Around here? Yeah. Ooh, we're in there. Give or take. Give or take. It's all right. What do you think? Like memory and writing and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm not right where this is going to surprise you, I guess. Uh, it's anal. <laughs> the anal stage. Again, so that very literal reference, of course, is to the potty training, um, is to that kind of critical point in the person's, in the, in the child's life. But uh, what's the metaphor here? Anybody got a sense of that? What's the, what's the metaphor going on for this anal stage, this potty training, really? What's a kid learning at this age? Yes, ma'am. To like control themselves. Very good. So, what do you mean control themselves? Well, because they need to control when they need to go to the bathroom and what they need to do when they feel bad. Very good. So, when you have a kid earlier than this, or before you even started talking about potty training, right? They got a diaper on for a reason, and when they feel the need to go, there's not this thing that we, by the time that we're adults, have where it's like. Oop! Don't go, hold it. Kids just let it flow, right? There's not that sort of stop button for them. They feel the urge and it just happens. And so the first step in potty training, a child is saying, don't do that, wait. I know that you feel like you've gotta poop, but don't, don't poop. This is the first time the child has probably been asked to control themselves, right? 18 months old, Maybe you stop them from putting something in their mouth, but that's not really self-control. If you're a parent, you're just gonna move it out of their reach. You're not gonna say, now don't pick that back up, right? Because the kid doesn't have that sense at 18 months. But as you start getting to two, three years old, they've got a sense of this. Mommy said no, right? And so they've got a sense of control, but this big lesson, this important lesson, and again, maybe the first one is do not poop in your pants. Go do that in the potty. What does the kid learn if they've got a parent who may be sitting in Dr. Gordon's class and says, I heard that at 18 months, you should be able to go to the potty like a big boy, like a big girl, and you're not doing that yet. We gotta get on this 
We gotta get your potty trained in check. For 19 months, I don't want you behind Sarah. Where are you reacting? Don't look like that. <laughs> well, this mom does. She's like, she's got stuff to do. I'm gonna have two years to try to potty train her again. What's this lesson? What's the lesson the kid's learning about control, about self-control? What's he learning here? That it's what? That it's like a forever thing. It's a forever thing? What do you mean? I don't know. That they're always going to have to have that self-control of like not going to the bathroom. Okay. I would say that. I'm not sure a kid thinks that far in advance yet. Yeah. All right. But there is something about, there's something in that. Hold on to it. What do you think? What's this kid learning if he thinks, or if he hears his mom, hey, we got to get this done at 18 months? He doesn't have it. Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, they're being trained to do it. What's the take home? Is that you speaking? What? Yeah, it was you. What were you saying? Uh, that he doesn't have the he doesn't have control over it. That he doesn't have control. Maybe so. Here's what he's learning. Okay. Kids at this age, they just met. They just met their parents. Like they don't know about parent-children relationships. They know they love their parents, whatever that means. They know that's important, but they don't necessarily know it's forever. They don't necessarily know that this person is supposed to look after them for most of their life. And so, kids can sometimes hear parents punishing them or parents giving orders or parents giving rules as if you don't do this I'm not going to love you anymore this is what mommy wants right and not that parents say that but there's some consequence behind what she's saying right and last time I didn't do something she yelled at me or she spanked me or I, I, I think she doesn't love me if I don't do what she wants that's how parenting works, right? I don't see you listening to them. But here we go. So at this age, it's sort of a literal concept. She's gonna stop loving you. So if I don't get this potty thing right, if I don't learn to control myself, mom's not gonna love me. Let's flash forward to an adult. People aren't gonna love me if I can't control myself. What type of person does this create? What's that? An anxious one, and how does that show up? Does that show up? Yes, ma'am. Very good. They become, and here's the name of the complex, this is where this comes from. They become what we call anal retentive. What's that mean? What's anal retentive? Who has one to talk? Yes, ma'am. In the black man. Anal retentive, right here, in the bridge. Um, okay, they're always on edge. They're kind of always stressed out. Yes, ma'am, behind her. What's it like if somebody's anal retentive? Let me help you. You would just say anal. That's where that comes from. And you're so anal. Why are you so anal? What's that mean? Yes, ma'am. Anal, like when they're super strict, and they have to constantly follow like, a plan, but they stray from it because they're scared about what will happen. Here we go. We see how this is connected, right? Somebody who's anal is somebody who has to have a plan and is very strict and has to follow it and gets really anxious if they don't do the thing, right? Freud again would have connected that to this lesson about control early in life. This sense that the kid, when they first learned about control, learned that it was really, really important. Mommy won't love you. People won't love you if you can't, right? And so it produces this 
personality characteristic, somebody who really, really thinks things need to be a certain way or the world's gonna fall down. What about the parent that's in here going, okay, I heard, do not press your kid too hard on potty training. You know, they can become one of these anal people, schedules, all that. Oof. So, I've heard I got up until 36 months. I'll give them 38 just to be sure. And around 38 months, I will mention the idea of potty training. See how he feels about it. If he's not into it, I mean, that's cool, man. Like, you just let me know when you're ready to go to the potty. Like, no pressure at all. We'll keep buying diapers as long as it takes. What's this kid learning about control? You don't have to have it all. What's that? You don't have to have any. You don't have to have any. Right? That, what? You can do what you want without you can, consequences. You can do what you want without consequences. Doesn't matter. Mommy's going to clean it up. Mommy's going to take care of it. Mommy thinks that your needs are more important than anybody else's. This has a great term. <laughs> this one's called anal expulsion. Okay. This is, uh, you know, constipation and diarrhea, basically. So, the idea of the anal expulsive, of course, personality uh, is that here you have a person who doesn't think that self-control is important, that doesn't think that um, order and timeliness and self-control, right? All of those things don't really matter. The universe does not hinge on those things. Somebody will come along and clean it up for me. All right, no big deal. Who am I hurting? And so you can see how you get these different personality characteristics just out of this one incident in childhood. One of the things that Freud is really known for is this idea of a psychoanalytic psychology. I'll give you this word. Psychoanalytic psychology. You may have heard of something, for instance, called psychoanalysis, uh, which is a particular type of um, psychotherapy that uses psycho analytic theories to work through a client's issues. But the basic idea of psychoanalytic theory is that two things. One, your history very much makes up who you are in the current moment. That your history very much makes up who you are. Now, maybe we're shrugging at that today, but that is formal, right? That is novel. That is groundbreaking at the time. We really, really had this sense of ourselves, you know, pre-Darwin, pre-Freud, all of these folks that kind of pre-Galileo, right? All of these folks who sort of set us in our place, right? We really had this sense that we were the masters of our fate, the masters of the universe, the masters of the moment. And so the sense that who I am today is out of my control, it has something to do with what happened to me. That's ridiculous. I am in control of who I am. How dare you tell me that something else is in charge of my fate? I'm a human, right? And so it was through folks like Freud and through folks like Darwin who says, listen, we didn't descend from the sky, like we're just the cousin of that monkey that you got in the cage over there, that we kind of get some of this perspective. So psychoanalytic psychology, again, for one, is looking at your history, is wondering how your history affects your day-to-day -day life, your personality, your relationships, your perspective. But it's also gonna say that a lot of that stuff that comes out of your history isn't found in your ego. You didn't put it there for safekeeping. The fact that mommy was really mean when she potty trained you, it's not where you put that. You're a good person and you come from good people, so mom's a good person. I don't wanna think she's terrible. I gotta bury that down here somewhere. And yet, I still have this really anal, retentive way of operating in the world. Even though I don't think my mom was a bad person, there are these ways in which her behavior is still affecting me, is still showing up. Right? 
So the idea of the psychoanalytic psychology, again, is that your history speaks into your unconsciousness and makes you into this person that you might not have a real sense of how you got there. You might not have a real sense of, and again, in Freud's day, we're looking at issues, we're looking at problems, so you might ha have a sense of what's wrong with you, really. Questions about this? So we're going to stop here. There are three more stages, um, but I just didn't want to get cut off in the middle of one of them. So uh, look for the lecture that will come out of tomorrow. You might see Friday over the weekend before you see it. Uh, but look for the lecture that will come out of tomorrow uh, to get the rest of this list. In the meantime, um, I will post the lecture from yesterday up. Again, we'll be talking about in ego, super ego. We're also going to be talking about uh, defense mechanisms in that video. Uh, which are pretty interesting, uh, and I will link a key and peel video in the in the playlist that uh, goes along with that. Okay, I will see you in two weeks.